Okay, good morning, everyone. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, please, we can. Good morning. Good morning again. Um, this is the WAIC Network, and we are delighted to meet with you again this month. WAIC is a capacity building platform for women and postgraduate students in the built environment. It's more like a support group. We help each other grow as we advance through our academic career. At WAIC, um, we provide support, we provide um, formal and informal mentoring, networking, and collaboration. We meet online every month. And when we meet, we try to touch base and also to learn and relearn how to improve upon our teaching and our research outcomes. So we've had several insightful and educative um, sessions since WIKE started two years ago. And today we'll be having another exciting webinar. The title of today's webinar is Effective Use of Theories in Research. We all know that theories are very critical in research, particularly in social science research. And um, theories help us to um, they enhance our understanding of a concept um, they can also help us to look at a perspective, look at an issue or a concept from a particular perspective of the stuff. So today we have um, four amazing researchers that would be giving us perspective to this all important topic. They will be shedding more light um, to the topic of, of um, theories. So in no particular order, we would like to celebrate and welcome these amazing women who will be um, Welcoming Dr. Rita Zhang. She is an associate professor in the School of Property, Construction and Project Management at RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia. Doc, we are really grateful to have you um, come um, to share from your wealth of experience today, noting particularly the time difference between the two parts of the globe. But honestly, Doc, we are grateful and we do not take your your presence for, for granted at all. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much. We also have with us today, Dr. Messi Ogunusi. She's um, an architect by profession and she works with um, Scout. Um, she works at um, Robert Gordon University in the UK at the South, at the Scout Sutherland School of Architecture and Built Environment. Doc, you're welcome. Thanks for your support every time. Uh, Thank we you. Also, yeah. <laughs> We also have Dr. Na. Dr. Na um, is a content surveyor by profession, and she's um, she she works with Assisi University Ghana, and she's um, at the Humanities and Social Sciences Department. Doc, you're also very welcome. We will also be having Dr. Pat, Dr. Patricia Kio, from um, Pittsburgh University in the US, I think she's on transit. She did promise she was going to um, join us and I'm sure um, she will join us as we go. So we'll just celebrate all these um, amazing women and um, we, are, we, are, um, we, are, we are proud and um, when we see your strides, when we see that you blaze the trail and um, you, know, um, you blaze the trail and um, you, you impact us by your works. Um, we, we're watching from the sides and we're looking at all of you and um, admiring the great star strides, which are an inspiration to all of us. We celebrate all of you, Mass, and um, we look forward to a great um, one hour um, discussion. We'll also learn um, about our, our, our panelists very shortly from their biography. Um, as uh, their biography are read, we'll learn a little bit about these uh, amazing researchers. But for the rest of us, I would like to say a very big welcome to all of you. Thank you for always being there. And thank you for um, making WAIC work. <laughs> thank you so much. And just um, sit back, put in your questions and your comments in the chat, and at the appropriate time, they will be attended to. Thank you so much. So we'll just take the biographies now. Zara, you said? Yes, ma. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, session. Today, so um, I will just go straight into the citation of our first guest speaker. So you can share the screen, ma. Yeah, sharing already. Okay, okay. Thank you. 
Dr. Rita Zhang will be taking the citation now. Rita Zhang is an Associate Professor in Construction Management in the School of Property, Construction and Project Management at RMIT University. She conducts research in construction work, health and safety, WHS, safety governance and social responsibility. Rita actively engages with industry for research development and undertakes research of practical implications. Her research has been funded by government agencies, pri private construction organizations, and corporate research centers, CRC. Her work has received high recognition by getting published in top-ranked construction management journals and winning best paper awards in international conferences. She is also the guest editor for the ASCE Journal of Management in Engineering Special Collection on Workforce Development and Support in the Architecture, Engineering and Construction construction Industry. Okay, so I'll be taking Dr. Nas's biography. He who knows not can know from learning. This Akan and Dinkra symbol and saying epitomizes what drives Dr. Nas's endeavor a quest to both pursue and propagate knowledge to advance practice. So there, Dr. Na, Dr. Na graduated from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology with a BSc honors in building technology and a PhD in building technology. She is a fellow of the Ghana Institution of Surveyors and a certified member of the Project Management Institute. She is a scholar practitioner she has worked in different Ghanaian public and private universities and is currently with Ahesi, Ahesi University as a senior lecturer in the humanities and social science department. She teaches leadership, real estate development, project management and research methods. Her research interests are primarily in innovation, adoption and sustainability. She is a quantity surveyor with over a decade's experience practicing surveying, project and contract management. Now to Dr. Patricia Kiel's biography. Patricia Kiel holds a PhD in architecture with a specialization in circular economy from Texas A&M University, College Station, USA. She's a member of the Nigerian Institute of Architects. Dr. Kiel has published several peer-reviewed articles in highly preferred journals such as Journal of Cleaner Production, Energy and Buildings, and Waste and Biomass Valorization. She is also a reviewer for the Engineering, Construction and Architectural Management Journal. Kyo serves on the editorial board of TAD Journal. Her teaching and research interests include architectural design, sustainable architecture, materials, building and environmental system integration, and smart circular economy. All right. Dr. Marcy Ogunusi. Dr. Marcy Ogunusi is an accomplished scholar and professional construction project manager. She holds a doctor of philosophy from the Robert Gordon University in 2023 with research interests in infrastructure sustainability. She has to her credit nine research articles with wide readership and citation in leading journals. Mercy studied architectural technology at the Lagos State Polytechnic, then a graduate diploma in project management at the Brighton School of Business, UK. In 2014, she completed a master's degree program at the Robert Gordon University, graduating with distinction at the top of her class. This feat and dedication paved way for her PhD study at the same school in 2019, which was marked with great scholarly achievements. Dr. Mercy's professional experience, Dr. Mercy's professional experience spanned across different sectors of the built environment over the last 21 years. She worked with the highly reputed Comprehensive Project Management Service Limited in Lagos. In 2011, Dr. Mercy founded Hamasol Concepts, which later became Hamasol Project and Service Limited, HPSL. As a founder, she managed several commercial and residential projects for individuals and corporate organizations. 
Dr. Mercy is the recipient of several awards, which include the Presidential Award of the Nigerian National Youth Service Corps, 1998-1999. Best graduating student of the RGU MSc class of 2015, IEMA Sponsor Prize at the IEMA 2022 Seed Conference. Dr. Mercy is a Chartered Construction Manager of the Chartered Institute of Building, an Associate Fellow of Higher Education Academy, an affiliate member with Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. As a leader, she was the class representative, RGU MSc class 2014-2015, and the first female president of the Architectural Student Association at the Lagos State Polytechnic in 1999. Dr. Mercy is currently an associate lecturer with University College of Estate Management, UCEM, and a demonstrator with Robert Gordon University, RGU, United Kingdom. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. So, um, Dr. Rita, you have the floor now. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Thank you, Patience and Zara, um, for the welcome and introduction. And thanks, Women um, Academics in Construction, for inviting me to deliver this webinar on effective use of theories in research. So this evening, I'm going to talk, talk about three topics. The first one, what is a theory? Second, why do we use theories in research? And third, how do you use theories in research? For the third topic, um, I will illustrate with examples drawn on my previous studies. So first, um, what is a theory? Here, I listed a couple of definitions for theories. The first definition considers a theory as a set of interrelated constructs or variables definitions and propositions that presents a systematic view of a phenomena by specifying relationships among variables um, with the purpose of explaining natural phenomena. The second definition defines a theory as a formal logical explanation of some events that includes predictions of how things relate to, relate to, to one another. Generally, a theory serves to specify relationships, explain phenomena, and predict events. Theories can be generally categorized into three types. The first one is called micro-level theories, which provide explanations limited to individuals and small groups. This type of theories help to explain personal perceptions, experiences, behaviors and interact, interactions, et cetera. You probably can find many of these types of theories um, in a psychology area, for example. The second type of um, theory is called um, meso-level theories, linking the micro-level and macro-level theories. This type of theories is related to organizations, um, social groups, or communities. For example, when we study an organization, we use a lot of organizational theories to explain the organizational behavior. The third type of theory is called macro-level theories, which help to explain larger aggregates. For example, explain what's happening in the social institutions, culture systems, or even the whole society. So the second topic, why do we use theories in research? So to answer this question, we probably need to understand the basic functions of theories first. Generally, theories serve four different functions. The first one is called descriptive function. When we discussed the definition earlier, we mentioned that theories describe phenomena and explain how and why things occur in a certain way. Basically, theories explain the underlying process or mechanisms that give rise to observed phenomena. The second is delimiting function. 
Theory serve as a guide to what should be examined. Theories help to set boundary and define the scope for our research. For example, theories help us to determine which set of factors to be focused on and which specific perspective to be used for our study. The third function is called generative function. This involves generating new research ideas and stimulating investigations. For example, we apply a theory in, in a research context and generate hypotheses for testing. We employ a theory from one discipline and apply the theory in another discipline to generate new insights. We test the applicability of a theory in a specific context and further refine the theory. So this function is very critical to knowledge adv advancement and scientific, research, uh, scientific inquiry. The fourth function is called integrative function. It talks about um, the ability to combine and organize various propositions and constructs into a consistent and unified system of understanding. For example, we often employ theories in our research to develop a research model for testing. So why do we use theories in research? We're all academics in construction here, and we understand how important a solid structure is in a building construction process. So basically, theory provides the framework for research, just like a structural steel or reinforced concrete framework, framework uh, which is used in the building. So in our research, theories guide our research questions, determine the scope and relationships to be examined in our research, decide what data to be collected, help us to analyze and interpret results, um, advance knowledge by provide contextual explanations to phenomena. So in the following time, I'm going to explain how to use theories in research primarily drawing on my previous studies um, as examples. When we use theories in quantitative research, they're often used in a deductive way. So we aim to test or verify a theory in our research context rather than developing a new one. In a quantitative research, theories provide a guiding framework for the entire study. Theories form the theoretical underpinning or foundation for research. Theories also act as an organizing model for developing a research model to be tested, um, formulating hypotheses, and determining the procedures for data collection. So the diagram on the right side basically illustrates how theories are used in a quantitative research. As we just mentioned, researchers often test or verify a theory um, in quantitative research. Based on the theory, we then develop a research model and associate hypothesis for testing. We then define and operation, operationalize um, the constructs or variables um, derived from the theory. After that, we decide how to measure the variables, often using existing measurement scales and develop an instrument for data collection. For example, we often use a survey to collect data. We then analyze the quantitative data to test the hypothesis and confirm or disconfirm the theory. The research results will advise knowledge by using the theory to provide a contextual explanation in a particular field. Okay, now I'm going to just use an example to illustrate um, the use of theories in a quantitative research. So this study was undertaken by one of my PhD students to understand construction workers' intention to transfer occupational health and safety training into practice. As highlighted in the text, this study aimed to explore factors that affect intention to transfer occupational health and safety training and also to compare and contrast the influential factors among managerial or, profession, or professional construction workers and non-managerial or manual construction workers 
in the Australia construction industry. Through extensive literature review, um, the PhD student identified the theory of plant behavior, PPP, which is a well-established motivational theory explaining individual behaviors. TPP was used as a theoretical foundation for this particular study. According to TPP, a person's intention to perform a behavior is determined by attitude, subjective norm, and perceived behavioral control. And each of the constructs is affected by a set of beliefs, for example, behavioral beliefs, um, normative beliefs, and control beliefs. As mentioned earlier, one function of theories is this descriptive function. In our study, we clearly explain the theory by describing the relationships between variables and the underlying process and mechanism. In addition, we also justified the applicability of the theory and inform how the theory has been used in this field and identify any research gap. If you recall, theories also serve the delimiting fun function and the integrative function. So as shown on the left side in our study, the theory of TBB guided the development of an integrative research model and hypothesis and informed the constructs or variables and their relationships to be examined in the model. In our study, we described each hypothesis um, as shown on the right side. So on the right side, there's an example for hypothesis eight. We drew on the theory and other relevant literature to explain each hypothesis, uh, hypothesis through the process of theoretical rationale, which means we specify how and why the variables and relational statements are interrelated in a, in a study. Apart from informing the research model and the hypothesis, theories yeah. also inform how to define, operationalize, and measure each construct or variable. Basically, theories decide what, that, what data to be collected. Earlier, we mentioned the generative function of theories. According to the generative function, testing a theory in the research um, helps to generate new knowledge or new insights. For example, in this study, we found that the intention to transfer occupational health and safety training is affected by attitude and perceived behavioral control for managerial or professional construction workers, but not subjective norm. In contrast, the intention is affected by subjective norm and perceived behavioral control for non-managerial or manual construction workers, but not attitude. So this then led us to investigate the underlying reasons why there is such a difference. So basically through confirming and rejecting hypothesis, the use of theories helped us to advance knowledge by providing context specific explanation of phenomena. I also would like to show another example to illustrate sometimes more than one theory can be used um, integratively to develop a research model and hypothesis, given the assumptions underlying the theories are consistent. So we conducted this study to examine work family conflict issues among construction professionals. Um, specifically, we conducted the study by considering the bi bi-directional nature of work family conflict, examining work family boundary dynamics, and identifying within domain and boundary spanning determinants of work family conflict. In this study, we drew on two theories. We first used the boundary theory to explain how individuals create and maintain boundaries, assign specific meaning to different social domain, and further draw boundaries around roles within and across different social domains. The boundary theory also recognizes that individuals frequently transition between different domains. And the transition process is affected by, by two important parameters called boundary flexibility and permeability. 
we then used another theory, the theoretical uh, work family fit model to discuss within domain and boundary spanning demands and resources and ex explain how these demands and resources affect boundary management and boundary flexibility and permeability. So drawing on these two theories, we developed an integrative research model. So uh, by integrating these two theories, um, we basically proposed a research model to be tested, which proposed two main social domains. One is, one is the work domain, the other one is the family domain. Within these domains, construction professionals have different roles to play. And in this model, we also identified work domain demands and resources, family, demand, uh, family domain demands and resources, and boundary spanning demand and resources. We specified um, their interrelationships and explained how they impact on work family conflict. So this example shows, and sometimes we can use different theories, draw on different theories to, pro to propose an integ integrative research model. But um, importantly, the assumptions underlying the theories should be consistent, shouldn't be conflicting with each other. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use theories in qualitative research. So theories can be used in different ways in qualitative research. Um, the first way is to use theory to provide a guiding framework to explain a phenomenon, very similar to the way we, we have used theory in quantitative research. So again, I'm going to use an example to, to illustrate um, the way we use um, um, theories in, in qualitative research. So uh, in this example, um, in this study, we examined supervisors' transactional and transformational safety leadership behaviors in the construction industry. Um, specifically, this study aimed to review actions that um, constitutes safety promoting transactional and transformational leadership behaviors in frontline supervisors. In this study, we used the theory of transactional and transformational leadership as a theoretical framework to analyze and category frontline supervisor safety leadership behaviors. According to the theory of transaction and transformational leadership, transactional leadership has two main theoretical components, including contingent reward and management by exception. Transformational leadership has four theoretical components, including idealized influence, intellectual stimulation, um, individualized consideration, and inspirational motivation. So all these theoretical components will be guiding the analysis and organizing of research data later. Um, in this study, we collected the data through an ethnographic approach by which a researcher situated himself on construction site for observation, and for interacting with workers. The theoretical framework also shaped the aspects to be, obser uh, to be observed on the construction site and shaped the questions to be asked for construction workers. For example, the researcher asked, what do you think makes a good supervisor? And what do you think is an important leadership behavior for safety? In terms of the data analysis process, a hybrid approach comprising two cycles of coding was used. In the first round, an inductive form of coding was performed and codes nat naturally emerged from the data. In the second cycle of coding, the initial co codes were categorized deductively using the theory-driven framework based on transactional and transformational leadership components. So in conclusion, the theoretical framework, framework informed both data collection and data analysis. So this table here summarized our research results, further showing that the theory provides a guiding framework for categorizing supervisor safety leadership actions into transactional and transformational leadership traits. So this is the first example and first way of using theories in qualitative research.
The second way to use theories in qualitative research is to provide a theoretical lens or perspective to interpret data. A theory provides an advocacy perspective that shapes how data are analyzed and interpreted and provides a call for action or change. So again, uh, I'm going to use um, one of uh, my previous studies as an example. So in this example, the study aimed to develop an understanding of how interactions between supervisors and apprentices shape construction apprentices' safety learning and practice. So in terms of research, safety learning can be studied from different perspectives, different theoretical lens, different theoretical perspectives. Um, for example, behavioral perspective, for example, cognitive perspective, motivational perspective, etc. In our study, the theory of situated learning provides a specific perspective to understand safety learning. Drawing on the theory of situated learning in our study, safety learning is considered as a social activity situated in a workshop context and shaped by social interactions and expectations in a workplace context. So this a specific theoretical perspective subsequently informed the analysis and interpretation of data to understand how different types of supervisor apprentice social interaction have produced different safety learning outcomes. Um, so we identified three, type, uh, three types of interaction, social interactions in our study, including safety-focused supervision, um, laissez-faire supervision, and supervision emphasizing adaption in a situated work context. All, all these three different types of supervisions or interactions have produced different learning outcomes in terms of safety for construction apprentices. Um, the third way to use theories in qualitative research is to generate a new theory at the end point. So examples include the approach of grounded theory. This type of qualitative research involves an inductive process of collecting and analyzing data to observe broad themes and patterns to develop a generalized model or theory. So the diagram on the right, right side illustrates um, a simplified inductive process for generating theories. The process starts with information and data collection. And then researchers analyze data to form themes or categories and look for broad patterns, broad patterns or generalizations from the themes or patterns. At the end, researchers propose generalizations or theories drawing on past experience and literature. I personally haven't used grounded theory before. So in this, uh, in this session, I will be very happy to hear insights from other panel members who may have experience with um, building theories uh, through qualitative research. So in summary, theories are primarily used um, deductively in quantitative research. However, theories can be used in different ways in qualitative research, including using theories to provide a guiding framework or to provide a specific theoretical perspective to understand the data. Theories can also be generated from qualitative research as a new building process. So of course, there are other ways to use, use a theory in research. For example, we can use some additional relevant theories to explain findings in the discussion section um, of a study. So this is uh, the end of uh, my presentation and primarily drawing on my own research. And thank you for your time. And uh, I would be happy to join the other panel members for a discussion around how to effectively, uh, effectively use theories in research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doc, for a most insightful um lecture we are um, indeed very grateful we'll pick up questions at the end of um, the panel session can we just quickly have um, our photo session now
now that the house is still full, we'll just quickly take questions. Leonora, Leonora will pick up questions um, at the end of the panel session, if you don't mind. But let's just quickly take up our, question, our pictures now, now that the house is still full. Zara, are you helping us? Yeah, good. All right, on our cameras, on our cameras, okay. All right, so we'll be taking the photo while saying Waik after the count of two. One, two, go. Waik. All right. So let's take one more. All right. So we'll say Waik again after the count of two. One, two, go. Waik. Yeah. All right. I think that's, that'll be okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. We can't hear you, Ma. Yes, um, we'll go to the panel session. Dr. Na, you have the floor. Right. Good morning, everybody. It's such a pleasure to join you. I know it's a panel discussion. Um, Dr. Rita Zan, thanks so much. You've done an absolutely great job of emphasizing the key things that we must pay attention to. Um, I just want to, in this discussion, really pick on what Dr. Zan said and illustrate it with some of the challenges that I had using, um, using theory effectively in, in my PhD study. Um, let me just show a few slides. Now, before I do that, I want to just highlight certain things. So one of the key things about research is this continuum that we tend to have between ideas and theory, ideas and empirical observations. And I think it's very good if we understand this connection because then it helps us to appreciate how to effectively use the theories that we have. So mind you, a lot of us, um, particularly me when I was starting my um, PhD journey thought that it was about going to just pick up the data. But then there are ideas that happen up here that you're going to test empirically. And if you lose out on any of the continuums, then you're not actually carrying out good, good research. So I think the first thing I want to emphasize, and you see it in Dr. Zan's presentation, that there's always the ideas, which is your theory, and then she shows you the observations. And then based on that, she presents conclusions that increase our knowledge, right? So that is so important. And there are three key problems that we typically have as researchers when we are presenting our work and in using theory. So the first one is either there's no theory at all, and I put no theory in uh, quotation marks, I'll explain why, or we're applying the theory poorly or wrongly, or we are overly relying on theory, okay? So those are the three things. Now, for the first one, uh, with no theory, I put it in quotation marks, I started my PhD journey looking at solar technologies. And in Ghana, we have access to a lot of light and we can actually use the technologies, but there's no adoption. And even though I didn't articulate it in my mind, the reason why people don't use solar technology is that it was expensive. And so I put the no theory in quotations because whether you are explicit or not, you are coming to your research with some ideas of how things should work. So as much as possible, be explicit about the ideas you are coming with right? Be explicit about the ideas you are coming with, your own ideas. Be independent, be honest about the ideas and the thinking you are coming with. That is where theory comes from, yourself first, right? And then the second thing is, after you've looked at the ideas or the theories that you are bringing to the work, science is cumulative, it's collegial, right? So go in there and look at the literature, look at what others have said. What other theories are within the space, okay? So you bring your own theories, you explore other theories, right? Be, look at them and see how they, how they work, 
right? So I came thinking that it was just about, um, what do you call it, economics, but it was more than that, and I'll show you. Now, the second problem that we typically have is that we apply the theory wrongly, right? And you again, you see that um, Dr. Zan showed you different ways in which you can apply theory, right? So how do you actually apply theory? Most of us think of theory as a uh, chapter two, right? We're gonna put the theory in chapter two and that's where theory works. But theory actually, as Dr. Zan said, is the framework that ties everything together, right? So you're going to see your theory in your questions. You're going to see them in your, um, what do you call it? She said, she talked about the scope. She talked about the analysis, etc. right? So let me just show you what I mean. So this is a framework that I used, right? And at the beginning, I told you, I came at it with, um, people are not adopting solar because it's expensive. But when you have a theory, a framework that guides you like this, it tells you that adoption is not just about cost. Adoption is about how people get to know about it, the attitudes, and Dr. Zan mentioned attitudes from another theory, the, the attitudes that people have about it, et cetera, et cetera. So over there, then I begin to ask myself, what are the factors, do you see? So it helps you to ask the right questions. So if I want to influence people to adopt solar technologies, what should I look at? So the frame, the, the theory allows you to, up, like if you apply the theory properly, then you, you are able to ask the right questions, okay? When it comes to, for example, your method, right? You notice that adoption, this theory tells you that adoption is actually a process. And most people, when they are investigating adoption, they were looking at surveys, like using surveys, I like cross-sectional research. But if you understand the theory and know that it's a process, you want to be able to observe a process. So it tells you how your methods, what methods should you use? Perhaps you should do a longitudinal study rather than a cross-sectional study. So again, over there, you see that just understanding the theory informs the method that you should use. Okay, when it comes again to analysis, and again, Dr. Ritzazan gave us an example, but here again, if you are analyzing, so in my case, I had a series of interviews. If you want to analyze your interviews, this framework can help you to generate the themes, right? So are there themes on knowledge? Are there themes on attributes? Are there themes on decisions? So the, the theory gives you themes that you can use to analyze your work, right? So the way in which you need to apply theory is that you need to apply it in a coherent framework. See, it, you have to see that the theory is making meaning throughout your research. And you also need to see that you are critiquing the theory. Okay, so um, Dr. Zan said it's descriptive, but you also need to critique it. Perhaps there are, you know, problems in there about the way the theory was put forward. Okay, so evaluate it, ask questions of the theory. Does it sound rational? Is it logical? And mind you, it's an idea, but has it been tested? Are they just presenting the idea or there's evidence, there's observation to show where were the observations taking? All of these things will then give you your gap and where you want to fit in. So that's the way you apply the theory, okay? And mind you, we came with our own ideas. The third thing is, or the third problem that we typically have is an over-reliance on theory. Okay, so I know that we've talked about how to use effective theories, etc. So now all of us may think that every situation I need to have a theory, but there's something wrong when you are relying overly on theory. How does that happen? Again, Dr. Zan talked about the qualitative use where, for example, you're using grounded theory. Over there, we're trying to come up or generate a new theory. Right, advancing knowledge means that we want to come up with better explanations for how phenomenon is going. 
right? And that means that we need to be able, although we appreciate the theories that exist, we need to be able to step away from those theories and see if we can generate better theories that would better explain the phenomenon that we are, you know, we're exploring. So I think I, I will stop there and summarize what I said. One, remember in research or in knowledge generation, it's theory or ideas and observations. And so theory is always important. Two, we have normally three problems that we encounter when we deal with theories. Either there's no theory, whether explicitly or it's not there at all. You need to be explicit about what your ideas are, both your own ideas and what is in literature. You also need to apply the theory properly in a coherent framework, seeing it coming through all the different parts or steps or stages in the research. And then you don't want to be overly reliant on theory. Okay, so I will stop there and look forward to the discussions and questions. Thank you, Dr. Na, for giving perspective so, to the topic. So we'll have um, Dr. Pat, Dr. Pat. Yeah, good day, okay. everyone. Thanks. How, what they mean. But then, uh, like the previous speaker also said, using my experience, um, my research is in uh, sustainability. Um, uh, Patricia Q, I'm in Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts in the United States of America. So for my own experience, right now I'm in the Technology, Architecture and Design Journal. I'm one of the editorial board members. And this uh, past few months, I've been um, the associate editor. So we get these papers submitted to the journal. And um, I had to go through up to, let me say, 30 articles. So um, what are the common mistakes that people make due to the theories um, we also saw that it's a framework, the, Dr. Zang says a framework. It's also like your foundation in construction. We want to have a good foundation that will carry the structure. So that is what the theory is. And uh, the interesting part too that makes you happy, even though you are staying awake uh, in the midnight, writing, working, is that you're having a conversation with people who have gone through You're looking at to find about this topic and then what can I design? So you make your research design by profession. And for me, coming into research wasn't my dream. It was my husband, saying, oh, let's go to America to study. I was already certified in Nigeria. Most people said I don't want to go to school anymore. So when we come, the struggle was getting to read. So you must read to know the existing theories. You must look at that field, and that is where your literature review, what your literature review is about. Going in to say, I'm interested, so it starts with our interest, I'm interested in sustainability. So, but what have people been saying about sustainability? And then it becomes like a tree where you have so many branches. So you have to pick a branch, you get to the leaves, and then you get there and see which, what thing am I interested in? Do your interest has to be fed, which is where the previous speaker says your idea. So your interest, your idea should be the forefront. Don't try to copy anybody, try to be original because I love this and I want to do this. And then I go to find out. So you must do the work. When you choose where you want to go, you must then do the work where, which is to say, um, what have people been discussing about this, this particular topic? So that place now, that literature review is also something that is very difficult for us to, to go ahead and do. So going into your literature review, you find out the, the relationships between things in that field, you find out what they will call the variables. So they will be asking you, what are the variables? What are the things that you want to compare? So if you, in my own case, I focused on a quantitative research. I want to check, is this thing really sustainable comparing the numbers? So this guides me to, re to design my research. At the beginning, what am I going to do? What how am I going to get my data? How am I going to test it? How am I going to report it? So that will guide us into those theories. And then um, if we get to the research design because of our theory, the uh, another important part that uh, was always uh, empty or they always re re tell me to revise my paper 
it's in the discussion. When you get into the theories and then you find out what is Mr. A saying about this thing, what is Mr. B saying? So it's a conversation. You, you have to cite those people in your introduction and then you use their method. So you can, there's also a part called the mixed methods research. You must not stick to one way but you need to find out what people did and then you can now do a mixed methods research. So you're trying to add to knowledge and your knowledge can be in the combination of those theories and the combination of the, the um, research designs. And then the important thing will also be going into the discussion. When I have got my data and then I have tested what I want to test, which is in my own case, we had a living wall. So we had a scrap metal from General Motors and then my advisor, use this uh, scrap metal to create a novel living wall. So we had a living wall and then the students used the scrap metal to fabricate the planters for this living wall. And then the landscape uh, architecture students made uh, the plant choices. So we're trying to do circular economy to locally sourced plants. So we get the soil, we get the um, plant. And so when I joined the lab team, they already fabricated this thing. So what's, what is my own story in there? How do how is this thing performing when compared to other uh, same products or other similar things like a wall? So I compared this living wall with a brick wall facing the same direction. So as you go along reading, I I, I, did, I did my research design and nobody's going to help you there. You have to find it out yourself. So I did my research design and I'm going along the way. I find out that, oh, I have to check what is the sky view factor, which is how much exposure is that place to this, does that place have to the sun? because I cannot compare without having them on a standard. So sky view factor came into the picture and then the instruments. So what am I going to use to check this thing? I have to learn how to use these instruments as I go on. Then I'm getting a camera, then I'm getting a thermal imaging camera, then I'm getting a logger to measure these things every um, 30 minutes to measure the, the uh, things that the variables that will tell me about the microclimate. So I end up comparing the microclimate, but everything does not come at once as you read. You get the variables as you read you you send it out to um the journals too because you have to you can do a one uh dissertation book or you can do three or more journal papers so as you send it out it, it's a collective effort to kind of get your research done so you don't want to depend only on your advice so you, you also have to drive it you also have to send papers out to journal look out they are learning from everybody in that field so at the end of the day when i characterize this uh, material and then go to my discussion section. I then look out for everywhere in the world who has done something about living walls. What was the difference in their temperature? So I'm reporting that in Japan, somebody compared their living wall and they have this uh, difference in temperature. I'm, I'm reporting that in America, somebody compared it. I'm checking out my climates. What is this? Um, is it a tropical? So it was humid subtropical climate. So I'll say in the same climate, this is the difference. In the other climate, this is the difference. I'm measuring the, the difference in those variables every 30 minutes. I'm going to run a simulation with, so I, I learned from uh, Dr. Shi, I think she has a video on uh, YouTube. So it was from YouTube, I learned how to do the simulation using the MVMET. And then I simulated with my data that I got, because all these things are from people's papers. So you just keep on reading, the theories will evolve. You are you're comparing, and then you must go to your discussion and then say, these people use this tool also. These people also um, check the difference in temperature or whatever method that you chose to use. And then that will also be the theory you adding. So they'll say it's like a, a fabric. You're weaving some more things to it. So that's, I'll stop here for now. And then if anybody has a question, my email is a pq1 at feedboxday.edu. So send in your questions. I'll look at it also answer as I go along. Thank you. Doc, thank you so much for for your contributions as well. Let's quickly have um, Dr. Mercy. Okay. Um... Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Pat, for having me. And thank you to um, Dr. Rita, Dr. Patricia, and our last speaker. I'm so honored to be here. And um, I've all the, I mean, the presentation from the previous speaker, they're so insightful. I've learned a lot. I've gained a lot. And um, I hope you can see me, right? Yes, so um, I will just speak on the approach to theory development, and it will be based on part of my PhD. I just completed my PhD uh, last year. It was, um, I mean, a very um, amazing journey. And um, 
part of um, my work in my PhD, I had to discuss around approach to theory development. And I will pick it from, especially when Dr. Na talks about no theory, because the impression I was given at the early stage of my PhD was that um, you need to always develop a theory before you can collect the data. And I struggled with it initially that, okay, what about if I have a data and I identify a theory that align with it or set of theories that align with it and I'm able to work around it. Even at, at, the, at the early stage, I think my year one, there were some ideas that were coming from my mind and I would discuss with my, my supervisors, people around me, and it would be like, oh, it can't come from you. And it was like, oh, some of them will have to be at the professorial level. And it was a bit confusing for me. But I'm so glad when I saw, I mean, a particular definition around the approach to theory. And that has to do with induction, deduct deduction, and abduction. And if I look at the, at the definition of deduction, it has to do with when, okay, let me pick it from um, induction. Induction is, it entails a theory development where a researcher begins with data collection designed to investigate a phenomenon. So that means that the researcher has a data, the researcher has already obtained a data. So what can we say to that? Does it mean that the researcher did not go about identifying theories before collecting a data? Yes, I know the definition for deduction has to do with um, theory evolving from literature review. That's the text study. An advanced study, you know, that has to do with, yes, you have, I mean, series of, I mean, resources that you have to refer to. But what about if you have data and you now need to develop theory from it? Is it not possible? So those are kind of struggle that I had at the initial stage of my PhD. And in the course of my, I mean, my writing stage, I, I came across this and it was like, wow, this is like a, a nine opener, an escape route for me and all like that. And of course, the combination of the two of them is abductive, abductive research. That's when you merge the two together. It's either you have, I mean, when you have, I mean, data that you've collected and you have, I mean, literature review already, and maybe you now find yourself triangulating and on like that. A typical example is uh, one of the papers that I published. I mean, it's it was a conference um, presentation. It's still under publication, though. Um, I don't know if I can just let me see if I can just share for. Is this something I can share this paper? I think it's um if it's um within reach, you can. Okay. Well, that paper maybe at um convenient time anybody can go there and check. It was actually titled. Five hours for waste management of abandoned um, infrastructure. And how did I come about that paper? Uh, because of my data collection, I mean my my work, I I had my my first few papers were quantitative. But along the line, there was a gap. There was no qualitative um or papers around my research area. And I had to do, I mean, qualitative. So I conducted an interview. And in the course of, I mean, try, I mean transcribing my, my data that I collected, I had to, I mean, I, I had to I mean, apply for, um, I mean, to attend a conference. And when I got to know about the conference, I saw some of the previous proceedings from, I mean, the previous years, and I saw a particular uh, paper that talks about, you know, I mean, I think around the three, three hours of so, 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 and on like that. Yes, I've heard about three years, you know, when you talk about multiple hour systems of waste management, but for the first time, that particular paper made an impression to me. And I had to look back into my, data that I collected, that I mean the interview, the semi-structure interview that I collected. And by the time I started the scoping review, I realized that I could actually 
develop multiple hours, even from my data. And that has to do with some of the responses, some of the responses generated from the participant in the course of their discussion. And before you know it, that was the data that I collected. I had to now develop theories from there, imagine teams started coming up from there. And before you know it, I had five hours from that data that I collected. That was not even the intention of the, 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 the semi-structured interview. It was, I mean, there's so many other development from there, but that particular one, I had to develop five hours from the data that I collected and I analyzed it. I developed it into a paper. So, and that's where I now had to discuss it in the school, in the research that uh, this is a kind of confusion when it is that it's compulsory that um, there must be I mean, a, 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 a literature review before people can collect data. It could be vice versa. And that's why I'm emphasizing this aspect of approach to theory development, the deductive approach to theory development, the inductive approach to theory development, and the abductive approach to theory development. I think I will stop at that for now. If there are any other questions from anyone, we can pick it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Messi, for your contributions. The floor is now open to anyone and everyone who wants to either make a comment or ask a specific questions to any of the, the either to Dr. Zhang or to any of the panel discussants. So the, the floor is open. We did see Leonora's hands up at the beginning. So Leonora, you can pick your, you can take off your questions now. You can ask your question now. The floor is open. Hi, thank you so much. Um for this. Um, I would like to throw this question to any um, of the lecturers who would want to answer my question. And I want to say, first of all, say thank you to everyone, especially those who presented. That was remarkable. So I'm, I'm currently a PhD student, and um, my research is about organizational behavior. So I think when Dr. Zhang was talking, she made mention of how to use theories in qualitative study, because my research is geared towards the um, qualitative methods. Um, I'm a bit, I'm struggling because um, I'm using two theories in my work. So the first theory that I'm using is the set theory, and then also the conservation of resources. The set theory um, is, uh, is more about the sociology part. I've been able to get the gap between um, the, the set theory and then that of the core theory because the data, I've actually collected data and I'm looking at, I've already started with my analysis, drawn themes out of it. And I'm looking forward to developing a new theory because I've seen a gap between those two theories, which more or less I would want to get a theory that um, um, can be used to, um, explain what organizational silence is. But at a point I realized I was stuck because I started looking at the divergence and then the convergence of these two theories. And um, I think um, Dr. Nas spoke about theories had to be a framework from the start to the finishing point of your, your study. The question is, how then do I navigate these theories from the onset to the last part of my theories. And then again, if I want to develop a theory from my work, which I am using a grounded theory, um, how then do I combine grounded theory with more like an incident, a critical incident technique? Because that was the technique I use in collecting my data. But I'm using a thematic analysis instead of fragments because I see that uh, the thematic analysis well aligns with the analysis part of my work. Thank you. I suppose the question was to Dr. Na, right? Leonora. Um, it's to any, oh, to any Dr. Oh, okay, Na I you. or Dr. Zhang. Any, oh, sorry, any I thought you mentioned Dr. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so I, I don't mind uh, start first and then um, I will be more than happy to hear about the other panel members' insights as well. So, uh, 
Um, thank you for the question. So from what I heard, you actually started the research by identifying potentially appropriate theories for your research, but at the end, you kind of try to ex establish or develop a new theory out of your research, am I right? That's what I heard. Um, this is uh, quite abnormal. <laughs> so uh, my suggestion is, so my question for you is, what's your purpose of developing a new theory if you have found, okay, there are a couple of theories which are potentially useful, appropriate already for your study. Why do you need to um, establish a new new theory? Unless, unless the theories you have found are not applicable, you think, okay, there's no existing theory that, that can be applied in my research. And now I'm going to, I'm going to use a different um, way. I'm going to use an inductive way to develop a new theory, which can, can better explain the phenomenon within the field that I'm studying. So that's my first question. Second, I wonder when you say you are going to establish a new theory, are you meaning creating a brand new or you're actually refining the existing theories? Because when we use theory in our research, what is a theory? Theory is an universally applicable, re really, really general thing. When you actually apply a specific theory into your specific context, you are actually refining the theory, adapting the theory into your research, and you are still advancing the theory by refining and, and, and then um, by, by refining and adapting the, the, the theory. So my question is, when you say you are going to develop a new theory, are you meaning you are going to integrate these two theories and you re refine them and propose an adapted or refined one to suit your own context? So that that's my um. So I, I tried to, when I when I was listening to your your uh, explanation. These are a couple of questions in my mind actually. Okay, so Dr. Zhang, what I meant was, I'm using um social exchange theory and then conservation of resource theory to explain what organizational silence is as a behavior. Yeah. Now, uh, these two theories, each of them can explain some part of the, the the behavior but not entirely because there is a gap between the two so in 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 one of your questions you said am i going to merge so based on the gaps that i've been able to identify between these two i try to based on the 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 data i've collected and then the teams that are coming up i a code there's a possibility that i could be able to merge the two theories into one as like more like into one theory that can best explain organizational silence rather than using different theories to explain that concept or social phenomenon. I see. So what would be the outcome that you would be expecting from, from your research? Well, um, like you said, you don't have to rush into theory, um, research. I'm looking at how my data is going to evolve. But my question was, I got stuck because these two theories in a way explains this, but how to merge them is where my problem is. Because if I use just the set theory, it doesn't really explain, but um, when you go into the social, um, the organizational behavior, most people use the set theory. But when you come to, Okay. the concept of the phenomenon of organizational silence, there's a bit of psychology, which is about stress, yeah. that leads people to become silent in organizations. So that was why I also adopted the theory of uh, conservation of resource theory, which also explains some aspects of organizational silence. So I'm trying to merge yeah. the two so that it best explains it. But you could, I could also deduce that there are some um let's say elements that these two cannot explain everything for me and the other theories right. that i know of doesn't best explain it to me um best doesn't explain that phenomenon to the best of my knowledge i can hear there's some there's an issue here um, okay. if you remember 
what I um, what I introduced in my in my presentation earlier, there are different levels of theories. Yeah. So from what you just explained, I could hear you are looking at the individual level, and you are also looking at the organizational level. So you don't necessarily merge because these two theories are dealing with two different levels, mm -hmm. um, probably having different assumptions as well. For your study, if I were you, I probably wouldn't try to merge them. Instead, I'm going to look at the organizational silence, this phenomena from two different levels. At the individual level, what it means, what are the factors, what are the, what, what, how, how would you explain the phenomena? Okay. At the organizational level, so what type of an organizational theory can help you to explain? So instead of merge, because they can't be merged because they are okay. from different levels. I would I would suggest your your contribution of this study is actually to understand the same same phenomenon, but from different different levels, and they are complementing each other because you are looking at from individual level what it means for a person at the organizational level what it means as an um at at the higher level as organizational behavior so uh, and you don't need um and the other thing you were saying these two are not sufficient to adequately explain everything um you have to remember one thing each study has a scope and each study wouldn't be able to cover everything or explain everything what you can do is through by using these two theories in your in your study if you find okay actually there are some other aspects which are important but haven't been covered what you can do as i mentioned earlier you probably can extend or can adapt the exist the existing theories to incorporate the new findings and propose propose a new adapted theory as an outcome from your research instead of telling people i'm going to you know develop a brand new theory explaining something else you don't need to because um, as i said a theory can be limited in a certain way a theory is just a general thing a universally applicable thing when you apply a theory to a specific context you you can you are allowed to modify the theory to incorporate the new findings from your own study, that's exactly what we discussed earlier, the generative function to generate new insights, um, to incorporate new insights as outcome from your research. Okay, um, thank you. If I may, I want to just clarify one thing um, and then perhaps, let's, let's see. So <laughs> this, we normally talk about, when we say a literature review, right? It doesn't mean theory. Okay, a literature review is that you're going into the space about the phenomenon to find out what others or what knowledge exists over there, right? So your literature review will tell you what theories exist in that space, what methods have been used in that space, what... um. Uh, what, you call it, what results they have found in that space. So a literature review gives you a, what questions have been asked in that space. So a literature review gives you all the information in the space so that you understand, gives you a comprehensive understanding of the space. Okay, now as part of the literature review, if you remember what I said about the two continuum, the two poles of the continuum of research, or science, it's about ideas and empirical testing, right? So for you, Leonora, when you go into the space, you've learned about the space and you found two theories, okay? Now, if you found two theories, let's see whether these theories actually do a good job of explaining the phenomenon you are investigating. So then, you go into the phenomenon to test it in the particular context that you are. So you are collecting data, right? Based on what the theory says should happen. And then you recognize. So now you've recognized that there are limitations to the theory. And so you present recommendations as to how those theories can be refined or extended 
to accommodate the limitations that you found. Okay. You see. So let's be clear that a literature review doesn't necessarily mean theory. A literature review is a review of the space, exploring the, 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 the space. Now, the literature review also will tell you how you should apply that theory or how you should apply theory in general, right? Should you take a deductive approach? Because if you go into the space, for example, you conduct your literature review and everybody is using a, a particular theory and using a deductive approach, you might decide that, you know what? A lot of people have done that, but I want to see if I collect data, will I come back to that same theory? Or will I generate a new theory? So then you will apply theory in a, like, so in that case, you are starting from data inductively, but you are not necessarily applying a theory immediately. The theory comes at the end, but you still need to conduct a literature review. Then it tells you how to go about your research. Okay, so I think that a lot of us, the challenge we have is that we think that a literature review is theory. No, a literature review tells you, gives you good understanding of the space and tells you where the gap is. So sometimes even the gap is not necessarily in the way the theory is explained. The gap is in the fact that there's a theory that is, there's a conception or there's an explanation of how a phenomenon is working, but nobody has actually tested or collected data or evidence to show whether the explanation actually works. And so then you, if you're going into that space, your contribution and your addition to that theory is the evidence you are providing to support that theory. All right. So, um, I know the time is really short. There are a few things that we could have talked about, but it's fine. It's a good start and it will clarify a lot of things as we go along and we can reach out to each other as we go along. So those are the comments I would make. Okay, please, are you going to leave your emails at the comment yes. section? Okay, yes, fine. yes, yes. Okay, and um, thank you, Dr. Na. Thank you, Dr. Rita, for the, for the contribution. Um, Mercy, Dr. Mercy, you have something to say? before we pick other questions. Yes. Okay, thank you, Leonora. I, I want to lean on what uh, Dr. Na has said, and I think she has spoken extensively about um, what Leonora uh, said, asked from the literature mean, aspect of it. And I will still, I will not want to go from the data collection aspect of it because I, I guess she must have done some of her analysis and maybe she's trying to see how she can connect the theory to what she has received at this point. I want to bring your understanding to the fact that um, I'm not sure if <laughs> I stand to be corrected because we have intellectuals here. I'm not sure if you can actually develop a theory without your findings being peer reviewed. So whatever you've gotten must have been peer reviewed, maybe from um, from high quality a journal and other um, reliable resources before you can say you've developed a theory. And like Dr. Na actually said, literature review is not a theory. The same thing with your findings. When you have your findings, it's not a theory. Now, if you have a findings from the qualitative aspect, maybe semi-structured interview or not, I mean, I mean, normal interview, you could have what we call predefined themes or imagined themes. So if you have imagined themes, then the next is for you to provide recommendation, like Dr. Na has said, and that will now be considered at the, I mean, academic path for that, um, the for for that um, your findings to actually be considered, if it's going to be a theory in the long run. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you can't develop a theory, but at this level, as you're doing your work, 
It could be that you have emerging theories and the next is for you to provide a recommendation for your research and that will be taken onwards. Thank you. That's what I felt I should say. Okay, sorry, let me come in here. Okay, so okay. from listening, listening to the question, I think what is missing is the respect to like, the of 20 papers or and look at the conclusion. They always point you in the gap, you understand? So future studies should focus on this. That's the way you look at uh, up to 30 papers in that field, you will see what they point as your future study. And then look at those things and then pull out, okay, from this paper, they said, look at this in future and then tie it to your interests. So that will help you to have an overview of your design, which is your research question. What are you focusing on? Because it's not just about the theory, but what do you want to add? What will be the new knowledge? So you must find the new knowledge, which is where the previous speaker say, what is peer reviewed? Okay, so we are looking at what is the new knowledge you're adding to that organization. And then you talk about qualitative research. What are the methods that were applied in the literature review that you saw? How can you pick one of them? Like uh, Dr. Zhang said, you can compare at different levels. You can, you can even prefer that your workflow, the way you went about doing it, is the new thing that you're doing. For me, I did a lot of uh, methodology, so methodological workflows, or I can be saying I'm testing out this method and comparing it to the other results, but you cannot have an answer until you do that literature review and then identify gaps. So you will not choose the gaps, but you will find out the gaps in the conclusion from their findings. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I think, um, Dr. Zhang, are you trying to respond to something? Are you trying to respond? Uh, yes, okay, so, uh, so I just want to add one thing in terms of building theory. So often we say, yes, building theory detects, um, uh, starts with an um, inductive process. But um, if you look really, so again, going back to the fundamental definition of theories, what is a theory? Theory means something has been proven mm -hmm. over time. Theory can be applied in different situations. Theory has been the, the relationships among the variables have been tested over time. So if you want to develop a new theory, it's not just ending at, okay, I got my data. I felt like, yeah, through my analysis, yes, there are these relationships between A, B, C, D. That's my theory. That's not theory building because theory building involves testing process. You have to, um, you have to prove it's true. You have to prove the interrelationships that you proposed can be supported. So that's why if you look at the grounded theory, it's an iterative process. It's like you start with a data set and you, you propose a model and a theory or a pattern, and then you continue to collect data to prove it, to refine it, and then say, and say okay, this is a refined, refined theory of model. And then probably continue to collect more, more data, more, more, more set of data to further, to further prove. So that's what when we say theory building, it doesn't end at the point when you get the data, when you finish your data analysis, it involves iterative process to further testing, to refine. At the end, you can be confidently say, actually, this theory has been tested throughout my research, and now I can claim it's a theory. That's something I want to I want to add in. Thank you so much. So we can just wrap up on this set of questions. Thank you for all the excellent comments and the brilliant um suggestions. So let's um take um another set of questions. I see Bola Day hands up. So ma'am, you have the floor. Well done, ma'am. I. I have a little uh, question on this. I want to ask, as a master's uh, student, what, how many theory, or do we have a specific theory, or does it based on the one's uh, idea to have a, how many, does it have any numbering? Do we have up to, what I don't I don't want to specify either two or three does or how does one analyze or 
make the theory so that it will not be too uh, much or will not be will be enough. So as a master's uh, project, as a master's student, I want to know how many how many theory one should apply to uh, work. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we can, anybody can answer. Any of the panelists have, is free to answer. Okay. okay, let me let me start, um, Madam Bola. So for master's study, if you're doing a thesis, uh, it has to, like Dr. Zan said, there has to be a research question. So that's the beginning, your research question. And we said earlier about the literature review. So you want to do a proper literature review and that will feed into your introduction so we have what we call the problem statements what is the problem you're trying to solve and for me i think the best way to go about your problem statement is what are you interested in in the field of construction it can be materials it can be construction methods it can be applications we have a wide field that we need to focus on the problem what is the problem in that field so finding the problem or choosing the problem can come from you but the research question has to be state of the art. You are going to be adding to knowledge. So it, it may not be as a rigorous or as robust as I see people complain about oh, the quality is going down. So you might say, okay, let me look into the literature. What are other people said? How do they test the uh, resilience or they, they test the performance of this material? Then I'll go into these databases. We have Google Scholar. We have uh, the Elsevier. We have so many, um, so many places that we can get material. And then you'll be looking at literature within maybe the last five years, three years, and then as you read. So my advice also, you read. You most of them you will read the abstract, and then if it interests you, you will read the full paper to see what they, what is the conversation. Is a conversation going on about this material that is uh, metal rods that people are complaining about the quality. Is it leading to building collapse? So I'll be searching on these uh, databases. What are they saying about? metal rods in terms of building collapse, in terms of the material performance, in terms of the typology of building. So you see a lot of things will come in at you. And then you have to choose, am I going in the direction of types of building? Am I going in the direction of the material itself? Am I going in, in the direction of a building collapse? And then I begin to look out for literature in these areas. And then, like I said before, you'll be looking at the conclusion. In the conclusion, we are always told to write Future studies should focus on this. Think about who is going to continue my study. I'm continuing from where somebody has stopped, and then somebody will continue from where I've stopped, all right? So look at these things, and then the theories will come up as you read. You, you don't decide to choose, but it, it will come up like a, she said, Dr. Zanta is iterative. So I might read three papers today and say, oh, I'm going to do this. I sleep, I wake up, and I see another three tomorrow. You can change your mind, but you are building on something in a cyclic process so i'll stop there thank you for your for your contribution dr mercy you, have, you want to contribute yeah thank you um Bolade. thanks for the question and thank you dr pat for your your um suggestion around it so i will pick it from here um it's like um in my place they it where i come from my culture there's this saying that when woods fall on woods you have to pick the one from the top so in essence what i'm trying to infer is that for you to identify theories it's not something that you can just sit and think about oh i've been hearing lots of theories from dr zhang or dr pa everybody i've been mentioning theories how do i go about it no what you need to do Picking it from where past, um, Dr. Patricia um, finished, that you have to go through I mean, literature review, introduction, and everything like that. I would advise you that all your sources, your resources that you gathered based on your research that you want to conduct, go through their methodology area. They always identify the theory that they use. It's very rare that you will see any paper that's will not discuss the theory that was applied briefly. It could just be a sentence. And sometimes they might not even write it as theory. But by the time you read through, it's always around the, the methodology area, the discussion, the findings. 
that's where they normally discuss it. So when you now see those theories, now there are specific theories based, I mean, I mean and that is peculiar to a research. For instance, I talked about inductive, deductive, abductive. It's because of my research. It's because of what I was doing. You can compare it to people in the medical area that they will use it. They may use it if it relates to their work but not in all cases. So you now need to go through those papers, go through the, the theory that they use, then now pick those theories as they've mentioned them. Now read more, broaden your knowledge around it and see anyone that is closely related to what you're doing. Now it could be one, it could be two, it depends, it could be multiple. You might even end up triangulating as, as, as the need arises. But I would also want to bring to your understanding, as master students, I don't think you should subject yourself to too much of numbers of theories so that, because you know you have limited time, I think you have like three months or thereabout, so you don't want to find yourself in wide scope of work and you're counting two months, or I mean one month of submission and you've not even done anything. So maybe just one, I think it's an advice, just one, then you can now broaden, you can expand on it and do justice to it and you have a robust uh, discussion around your work. That's what I have to say, thank you. Thank you so much. I, um, Bolade, I don't know if she answered your question. I also saw um, David, David's, hand, David's hands were up. David, you still want to ask a question? Uh, good, uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We can hear you. Good morning. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask to the questions asked about uh, a colleague who, uh, who want to work and uh, she has two theories already, but uh, couldn't fit into her plans. But uh, Dr. Rita has actually uh, made a lot of contribution to that already. So you can't develop theory by yourself and actually apply theory. Take a lot of time for for authentications. So. You can't just develop theory by yourself and still apply it at the same time, because uh, theories are, are actually a, 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 a logical, systematic, and coherent explanations of phenomena of interest based on uh, evidence and rigorous testing. So, who is going to test your theories? You are going to test it by yourself and apply it by yourself. It's not going to work. So you can develop theory by yourself and actually apply it at the same time. So I think development of theories can be a project on, on each one, if I'm not mistaken. So to me, according to what Dr. Rita has actually said, uh, apply the one that is available, and uh, then if there's a need to develop a new one, for, then you can do that uh, on, on another base. But to develop theory by yourself and still apply it, to me, is not correct. That was a comment. Thank you so much, Sunday, for your comments. Yes, the floor is open. Okay. Yes, I think, um, I don't know who just spoke, but I think you got my question wrong. I did not say I was going to develop a theory and apply it. I said based on my data, because um, I was thinking of doing a mixed method. So after the qualitative, I was going to do a quantitative study. But anyway, thank you. I wasn't. I want to clarify. That I wasn't going to develop a theory and use it for myself. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. So, um, do we have other questions? The floor is still open. We have qu more questions, more comments. Yes, we have essay. Okay. Essay. The floor is Hello. open. Yes. Uh, one of the uh, one of the speaker talks about types of theories. I said, uh, she talks about inductive theories, abductive theories, and uh, deductive theories. I don't know if you can lay more light on that or if you can have uh, access to more information about that. Yes. Mercy, Hello? Are, you, are you going to talk about yeah. I um, just, just before Mercy starts, I, I, I don't think in terms of theories, there are inductive theories or, or deduct, deductive theories. Theories are theories. It's the way of applying theories or a way of doing research. Exactly. If you are applying 
a theory, we're testing the theory, for example, in the quantitative research, you develop a research model to test the theory. That's mm. a deductive process. But then if you want to develop using, for example, grounded theory to propose a pattern, propose a new theory, that's an inductive, uh, inductive process. Theories themselves are not categorized by inductive or, or, or deductive process. The process is de describing the research process. Messi, up to you. <laughs> thank okay. thank okay. you, Dr. Rita. You've really, you really helped me out. Exactly. She's 100% right. And that was exactly what happened when I mentioned it. I, I stated that I, I'm going to touch on the approach to the theory development. It's not a theory on its own. So, and that okay. was where I mentioned it's an approach to developing your theory. And that has to do with, if you have data, you know, I made mention of my experience during my PhD that I had to do, I mean, conduct a semi-structured interview, but I needed to attend a conference and going through the proceedings of some, I mean, of the conference, I saw a particular paper that discussed on multiple R systems, the three multiple R systems. And I went, I, I did, deeper into my data that I collected from the semi-structured interview after I've done the transcribing, the transcription, I realized that I was able to develop multiple R systems that are even more than what I saw in the proceeding, in one of the papers in the proceedings. And that was where I was able to confirm the inductive approach. That's, that's one. So it, it's just trying to make people comfortable that approach to, to theory, approach to developing theory, not necessarily have to be stick to the deductive. Deductive is when you deduce, you, you search for what exists within the academic world, within the, 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 the journal, within paper, what exists, how can what exists support the, my own research that I'm going to start. But for instance, you have data, maybe you have each data, depends on your, your method, your, your method of collecting the data. You have each data and you needed to develop more, I mean, I mean papers from it. And you you after your analysis, you realize that yes, you could have more papers from that. So that is what we're talking about approach to theory development. So it's not theory on it, so it's just approach. And there are three. You could read more on it. There's so many papers out there. There's so many journals out, out there in the databases. You could read induction, deduction, and abduction, whichever way you want to talk about it. It's just an approach. Thank you very much for the question. Just to add on, I'm just sharing my screen right now. I don't know how many of you have heard of the research wheel, where what Dr. John Dr. Zan and uh, Dr. Ogunasia said, it's just the connection, the way we, as I explained, it's finding knowledge is just a blend, like going through, coming up with ideas and testing those ideas, you see. So induction, abduction, deduction are just the ways in which we blend those things. Sometimes we have an idea of how things work and then we test it out through a hypothesis and then you collect data. Or sometimes, like Messi's case, you have the data already and then you're going through to see whether you can theorize from it. So um, as Messi said, there's a lot to learn. It's just understanding that um, science or research is a mix of things that are happening in your mind and the observations that you make through your senses and how you connect these things to generate knowledge. I absolutely agree with you, Na. That's perfect explanation. <laughs> so uh, even though um, in my presentation, I was saying, okay, when we use theory, we, we use it in a deductive, uh, deductive way or inductive way. In practice, there's no clear cut exactly as shown by, by now in, uh, in this, uh, on this slide, just shown by now. There's no clear deduct, uh, a clear cut. For example, let's say we start with a quantitative research and we want to test a theory. Yes, this sounds like a deductive process, 
you develop your hypothesis, you go to collect data, and you try to confirm or reject the hypothesis. But then as I shown in my presentation, after you got your findings and some hypothesis will be rejected, that means you have to extend the theory. You have to adapt the theory to your own particular, to your own particular context. You are actually doing inductive process. You are explaining, you are explaining why some hypotheses are rejected in my research. What are the reasons? That's exactly the inductive process. You're actually modifying the application of theory in your particular research context. Thank you so much. Um, I, um, I just hope you, your question has been answered, David. We have Essie. Essie, your hands are up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay, so I just have a question. I think uh, what Nada said something about um, theories being included in our literature review. So I came across uh, something for this, this this regarding paper paper um, research, and I was thinking, is it possible? Is it compulsory rather that you have a theoretical framework before you uh, that will include your theories, or you would just focus on including theories in your literature review so that's where my question is i don't know if i'm Please clear ask the last part again is it is it theory? compulsory that mm -hmm. you would have a theoretical framework before your literature review or you would just have your theories just included in your literature review okay <laughs> yes so it's a matter of how you so actually the way you approach the presentation of your literature review depends on what you are doing. Um, in other words, whether you're taking an inductive approach or a deductive approach. Okay, so if you're taking a deductive approach, then because in that approach, you are going to actually be testing theories, then it means that in your literature review, you will have to present some framework, you know, like a theoretical framework, which you are going to test, like you develop hypothesis from that you're going to test. Now, depend when it comes to um, more of inductive or qualitative approaches to research, you could go two different ways, right? If you are generating patterns or you're looking out for patterns and themes, your literature review would be more descriptive of what is existing, like what knowledge exists, okay? It's more descriptive so that we know what already exists and what you are bringing to the table. So it won't necessarily describe a frame, a, a theoretical framework that you're going to test, but it is describing it in such a way that you may, when you actually are doing your analysis, you may be using that as a basis for analysis, or you may be using that like to interpret or discuss your results. Okay, so um, I don't know whether I've answered your question properly, but what I'll say is how you present your literature and whether you include or the, the manner in which you include theory depends on what you intend to do in the work. If it's quantitative, the approach is different. If it's qualitative, the approach is also slightly different. That is the way perhaps I would choose to answer the question. Yeah, um, I, I, I quite... I agree with you that you could have a theoretical framework and some people call it, you know, conceptual framework. So it's in like, I mean, um, Dr. Nas said, it's from your literature review and you can use it at the start, the commencement of your research. And you can also use it to discuss your findings. So that is around um, the theoretical framework. And I think that's, I hope that is clear enough. Right, yes, so I can, yes. um, add, yeah, add a couple of fun points to this question. So uh, um, in my understanding, probably the question is more around how to, how to structure the sections. So how to structure the literature review and the theoretical framework. As Dr. Nam mentioned, this probably depends on your purpose of um, the research and, and the, the, the approach that you have used for doing the research. 
So often in my own experience, this is probably not uh, not something general general um generalizable. So in my own experience, if my research relies on quantitative research, a quantitative approach, uh, which means you are going to test a theory, test a research model or hypothesis. Often what I do is to review, to, to explain the theories and propose a framework first, and then explain the individual hypothesis because during the process of explaining the, um, the hypothesis, you have to draw on the existing literature to inform, to explain why you think there is a, there's a relationship there. So if you look at the, my papers heavily relying on quantitative research, I often structure my paper in a way, putting forward the theory and theoretical framework, propose the research model and a hypothesis, and then explain the individual hypothesis drawing on literature review. However, as um, Dr. Na mentioned, if you are doing a qualitative research can be different because as I mentioned earlier, for doing qualitative research, sometimes you use a theory to inform the perspective that you are looking at the situation, looking at the question. What you can do is provide a literature review about what's the existing research evidence, what's happening in this field, in this area, and then propose your theoretical lens, theoretical perspective. Okay, given this is a research evidence, it's the existing realm of research, from which perspective you are going to approach this particular area. So in that way, you probably can structure the literature review informing the research, existing research evidence informing the knowledge gap. Another important role of doing a literature review is to identify the knowledge gap, to inform the knowledge gap that you are going to fill by doing your own research. And then the next step is to uh, putting forward your theoretical lens to approach this particular uh, research topic. So that's my, my normal way, probably just representing my own experience, my normal way of structuring um, a research paper. Yes, thank you for all the um, brilliant contributions. Um, Bolade, are your hands still up? Is your hand still up? Are you still, you still want to ask a question or a mistake? Okay, um, can we just move on? Um, I, I, I can't seem to hear her. Um, yeah, do we have other questions? Do we have questions? Do we have more questions? Uh, questions or comments before we, before we shut down? Um, yeah. While we're yeah. thinking of questions, I just thought I should also check in this, that theories can also enhance the trajectory of your research, the overall outcome. And it's not it's not a fixed, it, it, it's not composite that could be a fixed outcome. Maybe if I pick it from Bolade when she, uh, sorry, either you or she, I don't know, asked about the framework. So at the end of it, the outcome of the use of theory could lead to a framework itself. And it could also lead to model development. And it could also lead to um, hypothesis, you know, maybe accepting or nullifying it. So it depends on what, it depends on what you have in mind to achieve and the eventual outcome of your research. So I said I should maybe also contribute that as we're expecting others to ask questions. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Messi, for that. Um, again, we ask for contributions or comments as we begin to round up today's session. Okay, um, I think we could just move on to the vote of thanks now. I appreciate everyone that has joined in. Um, let's have a proper appreciation. Curious Esther, please, can you help us with that? Okay. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we can all attest to it that this particular webinar has been very interactive. We've spent about one half for the lecture and almost uh, over an hour for the interactive session. We want to appreciate everyone that has contributed to this webinar. Firstly, we thank 
uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rita Zhang, our guest speaker for the day. We really appreciate you for all you have given us on the effective use of theories. We are glad that we've been able to be impacted through your presentation. Thank you very much. Also, we're going to appreciate all our panel uh, discussants. Dr. Na, thank you very much. We appreciate your the narration of your experience. You've been able to give us the theories uh, that even we without theories, we can actually go ahead. We, if we have uh, our data, we can go ahead to make our collect data, investigate, and do the analysis, and then apply properly in a coherent framework. We also appreciate Dr. Mercy Ogunosi. We appreciate Dr. Patricia Q from US. All your contributions, the three panel discussants are very, very impactful. We thank all those who have also asked questions. It has actually impacted more in every one of us through the questions we are richly blessed to because it brought in more explanation and we've been able to detect the approach is to be used when getting our theory. We've learned more about the inductive, the deductive, and the adductive. We have been richly blessed. So I want to say thank you to everyone who has contributed to this seminar. And also for everyone who has participated, all our participants, we thank you uh, for sparing your time to always come on board. And I also always want to thank our convener, Dr. Patience. Thank you for your sacrifice, for your dedication, and all those who are behind the screen. Thank you for always being there for us to have this uh, webinar on a monthly basis. So we want to say thank you, everyone. And we thank God for the success of this webinar. As I've said at the beginning of my comments, that this has been very, very interactive. And, uh, we've been really blessed. So thank you, one. Thank you all. God bless you. We hope to see you again next month for another insightful topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiris Esther. She's the co-convener. She's the co-convener of WIKE. Thank you for your for your wrapping words um as as a way of um, giving my final words i really want to appreciate everyone that has made it here today particularly dr zhang um all the way from australia thank you for the you know the sacrifice of your time like i said earlier thank you to all our amazing panelists from dr na to dr mercy to dr patricia we appreciate all of you dr pa thank you though you were um on transit you still um try to find time to to um to attend the webinar we are grateful and to the rest of us we really appreciate you thank you for the support all the time thank you for making wife work and we are grateful um i would also like to say that we put out these webinars because we want to impact and improve people um improve our writings and our research so please try to uh, interact go back with the um to watch the videos and interact with these things because with consistency comes mastery when you are consistent with something, you become better at it. So we need to engage with this, um, these um, nuggets that we have learned today. And of course, that goes up. That goes to say um, with all other webinars that we have had. So thank you again. Next month, we'll have another exciting webinar. We'll share the, 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 the details of the webinar through our various networks. So we do wish you a pleasant day and um, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the month. And we'll see you in June. Thank nice. you so much. Thank Bye. you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rita. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.